Hello and welcome everyone to Clavister Protects webinar, a new era of European cyber defense. In this webinar, we'll share insights with you from our recently conducted market survey. And through uh, story narration and security personas, we'll um, uh, share, provide you uh, recommendations to enhance your cybersecurity coverage. I'm your host for today, uh, co-host for today. In fact, my name is Nina Sharma. I'm part of the marketing team, and I'm joined today by Thomas Watson. As he's also part of the marketing team with a focus on market strategy and helping customers understand cyber landscape threat landscape better. Uh, we aim to use the uh, 40 45 minutes of this session to provide um, the presentation and content from our side but leave ample time for you to ask any questions so please use the uh, questions panel on your right uh, to type in your questions and we aim to take uh, as many questions as we can at the end of the session gives a little bit of background about uh, this survey and our objectives from uh, for this survey. Thomas, can we move to the next slide, please? So if you have been in the cybersecurity space like us uh, for a while, you would agree that you know uh, cybersecurity has seen a paradigm shift in the recent years, um, and especially cybersecurity in, in Europe. First, it was a pandemic that kind of led to the rise in the hybrid working phenomena and then Russian war on Ukraine. Um, the, these in, uh, events have brought cybersecurity <clears throat> to the foreground and made organizations realize across public sector and private how important um, cybersecurity is, how important not only to have protection against cyber threats, but also the ability to be able to um, detect and respond and remediate when things go bad. In terms of um, understanding the uh, pulse of the market and you know where we are on this journey, we see a lot of market surveys coming from either US or their global nature or um, you know driven from APAC, uh, Asia Pacific trends. But we haven't seen much that specifically focused on European organizations and European state of European cybersecurity. So that, that's why we, we decided to uh, um, do the survey and initial focus has been on Sweden, but we want to expand this across different European countries um, in 2023. In terms of um, survey uh, demographics, again, we wanted to have a comparative study between both public sector and private and see where you know um, a, a different how different maturity levels are for different sectors and even within public sector what education is doing or what municipalities are working on and and things like that so we uh, we uh, ensured a fair representation of that in terms of um, decision makers um, we have a 60 40 split in terms of business stakeholders and technology uh, stakeholders but it's all uh, key decision makers that are either directly involved in, in the uh, security purchasing decisions or they're part of the team. So it's a very strong demographic and very strong set of respondents that we have gone to. And in total, uh, the, the survey includes 500 responses, so again, quite a high number. Okay, moving on to our first topic then. Thomas, can we change the slide, please? Oh, it is changed to hybrid working, no? Yes, yes. Yeah, thank you for that. So our first topic um, for today is hybrid working. So it is it is one of those biggest shifts that we have seen in the recent time that we that has had an impact on cybersecurity. So when um, we all kind of were confined to our homes in pandemic in the initial stage of the pandemic suddenly that that uh, presented the challenge to businesses and uh, you know, public sector and uh, diff across various different industries in terms of how to make employees work 
securely from home. But to be honest, I think in the initial phase, the focus wasn't that much on security, but rather making sure that employees are able to work from home and then you know uh, uh, be able to access the applications that they need to be. But very quickly, the focus shifted on security. So if everybody's uh, accessing the data from outside the secure uh, confinements of offices or perimeter security. Now, what happens to security? How does that that change, and what um, different organizations need to do? So quickly, the focus shifted to security. Uh, Thomas, what do you think? Yes, thank you, Nina. Yes, indeed, the pandemic really hit us all by surprise. Uh, I talked to quite many customers out there, both in the public and the private sector and many faced enormous big challenges. So this is Anna. She's a typical IT manager at a public sector municipality, taking care of critical services for citizens in the area that they serve. And of course, Anna's job is already very tough. She needs to build an infrastructure that complies to very strict data laws, but also serves an organization that's inherently very service-minded, but also very, very pressured for cost. So everyone is under pressure and processes and routines need more and more become efficient, but also never fail. So Anna facilitates the digitization of this municipality and, and this includes public services, elderly care, public school systems and many other types of services. A typical colleague that, uh, that Anna has is Sophia. Uh, Sophia handles the requests for handicap adjustments and facilitates care for special needs children, for instance. So naturally, she works with data that requires a very high amount of confidentiality. And all municipality workers have their own workspace. There's a low amount of mobile workstations. Everybody comes to the office and Anna needs to manage uh, data centers 24 seven because there's, uh, there's, 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 there's use of, of cloud services, but only on a very limited way. Uh, so the setup is hybrid uh, because cloud is only allowed for some portion of the data. And then boom, of course, the pandemic hit, the world changes, the social distancing and quarantine measurements are being enforced and people had to practice social distancing. Uh, many workplaces, public services and restaurants are just completely closed. Uh, all employees are ordered to work from home, but of course the world keeps turning uh, and the citizens do require services, probably even more so during crisis. All meetings had to be done over video conferencing instead, including education um, for even the young students. So this is of course an enormous challenge for, for Anna to facilitate this shift in an organization that was not set up for remote working at all. For Anna, the first order of business is to really secure proper login to all services. Multi-factor authentication is really a must for logging to any services, especially when you access them for remote. Uh, our survey showed that the majority, actually more than two thirds, has already today started to enable a passwordless login experience. Uh, for services to their organization. This was much lower before the pandemic. So this is a good trend, it's great. But also in the same survey, um, IT managers admit that they typically barely cover 25% of the applications that their employees are using uh, and protect those with secure logins. That means that still 75% of the applications are just using normal passwords or possibly even worse authentication. And in the office, you might think that MFA is not you know, as critical uh, and might be just even a hurdle for employees to use, but as traffic passes over unsecure networks and terminals outside the office and school environments, it's very uh, naturally becomes more of a pressing situation to secure these logins. So that was the issue number one. But multi-factor authentication was only the first of Anna's worries. The infrastructure was congested 
as more and more of the Sofia colleagues were connecting through the secure gateway from home. So everybody moves out of the office in the home, connects via a improvised VPN system to the office and uh, turns all their traffic in, in the firewall there to lead to different service infrastructure. Highly congested situation. Um, the result of this is that it, it leads to improvised infrastructures, um, ad hoc scaling, um, and users take measures in their own hands and are likely to use more shadow IT services. And combine this with laptops that come from basements that have no good remote login, uh, as MFA was not rolled out properly yet, you can imagine that it became a terrible hard situation for Anna to secure confidential data and guarantee that critical services to the society would still be able to function. Anna could definitely not handle this workload to scale up and provide the business continuity that was desired. Uh, equipment was sold out at long lead times. Uh, it would take uh, way too long to install everything and make it operational for all employees. And on top of things, people now connect without protection. Hackers are clever and use this COVID as a trigger for social hacking and phishing attacks and malware have increased quite a lot since then. Of course, we know the end of this story that Anna has you know, woke it up and, and have overcome and a lot of people have come back to the office and, and we did make it through this crisis together, which is fantastic. Uh, and it, it's no denying that the world has changed. We fast forward a bit as the pandemic faded away, the taste of hybrid working has actually stayed behind. A lot of people have positive feelings about it with regards to more quality time at home, high efficiency, uh, more environmental friendly. So, you know, Anna's boss and many bosses out there certainly got a taste of it themselves and allowed people to work a certain percentage from home. In John's case, 50% uh, or work from anywhere when that's possible. It's undeniable that hybrid working is here to stay and schools even are doing remote working, uh, remote meetings with both students and parents e-health is more and more common and municipalities are using hybrid workplaces to attract more talent and fill up their skill gap as well so even though we made it through the pandemic by screwing nuts and bolts here and there and, and making improvised solutions for anna this is a continuous battle moving forward the resource needs on the network are unpredictable and she needs to manage for all scenarios she's Ask, asking for resources, asking for financing, but it's, but even if it's granted, it's not always that she'll manage in the timelines desired to make the, uh, the infrastructure work properly and smoothly and securely. So handing over back to Nina, in our survey, what does the remote trend look like moving forward? And how, are, how do organizations indicate in our survey that they are in fact ready? Sure. So before we actually uh, even move uh, to the survey results, we wanted to uh, provide a market view or analyst view uh, validating that hybrid working is definitely here to stay. And this is a trend that is going to drive um, security investments. So it, whether we look at it from demand side um, or supply side, both of the um, in, in both kind of areas, cybersecurity for hybrid working for remote working is a, is a top trend. So whether we uh, look at the CIOs top challenging the challenges in 2023 cybersecurity um, um, for hybrid workplaces features right at the top, and then um, when we relate it to what Gartner is saying is going to drive um, security investments, then remote working actually is right there at the top. So, um, you know, this is this is a trend we are going to see in the coming years, which of course it means from the organization side, they have to look at it and it might mean different things in the secu security solutions that they have to invest in are going to be different for different um, um, businesses. Uh, but it's all kind of pertaining to that one key trend our workspaces have changed and changed forever in this case so coming to our survey results um quickly if we move on to the next slide thomas 
uh, yep yeah, again it is all kind of uh, 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 our decision makers are validating what we have been saying uh, there is general consensus it means security changes and uh, 97 percent of people are agreeing that this is uh, relevant for them. This is what has made them have a look at their security posture and what changes are needed. 35% uh, of them have said that they're already, they have made changes and they have now sufficient or comprehensive security coverage to support hybrid working, but for others, it's, it's work in, in progress. And I'm not sure what those 3% uh, of organizations going to do that said it's not relevant for us. I think sooner or later, everybody is going to realize um, that that's kind of uh, the future that we are talking about here. Even when we look at the sector specific spending, um, on to the next slide, then unsurprisingly, public sector has been um, leading the change. And as uh, Thomas described, this is also due to the fact that that sector was probably least kind of ready to move to hybrid working or uh, so some of the sectors we never thought that remote working is even possible they are having to now manage this change so this is actually quite a positive trend to see that uh, with uh, access to sensitive information with citizen data public sector is actually leading that change so it's so really really uh, good to see that in there um, on the other hand side energy and utility um, sector has been Kind of slow to start, but again, understandably so because their requirements are slow, but again, quite different. Uh, setup is very um, different from sector or from a, a financial sector, for example, because a lot of things, a lot of operational technology need to be on site, right? That there. So a big portion of it cannot even move towards hybrid working or remote working, but IT systems and people who work with those systems are probably going to take the benefit and advantage of that um, hybrid working. So there the requirements are much more complicated and it shows it reflects in the survey results that um, energy and utilities started slow, ramping up fast, and then, you know, um, um, understanding the requirements and moving forward. So all in all, again, like I said, it's very positive to see that it's, it's a common trend and common kind of consensus amongst different sectors, whether commercial or private uh, or public. So that's good. With that, we move on to our second kind of uh, driver or event that has had very formidable effect um, on cybersecurity is a Russian war on Ukraine. Um, so first of all, we haven't kind of seen the cyber Armageddon that everybody was um, uh, uh, predicting. So far, this war is still fought using the most traditional ways, but we have seen the instances of cyber attacks on, you know, not only Ukraine, um, uh, Ukrainian infra um, critical infrastructure, but also Europe. And suddenly, you know, Europe is on a high alert and, and cybersecurity is so much in news these days. And then, you know, the, the context has changed. The threat, uh, I think organizations have realized the threat is real. It's not kind of a sudden change. This is this has been in the um, building up, right? In terms of the threat actors we see, or our uh, nation state threat actors that we have been um, monitoring or um, uh, 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 seeing their actions over the last few years. But suddenly, this year, for especially for European critical infrastructure. Um, it, it has been a pivotal shift uh, for cybersecurity. Now let's look at the um, survey results. So the question um, that we have asked is, since the start of the Russian-Ukraine war, have you taken any measures to improve your own cybersecurity staff or infrastructure? You'll see that in our survey, we haven't really asked questions about exact product that you're investing in or solution, but uh, we wanted to keep it at a high level and have a generic view of the whole sector um, um, uh, in this case. So the idea is to be able to you know, take a step back, understand how do we do security today, look at it holistically, understand the gaps, and then take decisions accordingly. Again, we're seeing quite a positive trend here. 
nine in 10 companies have said that they have uh, evaluated their security stack, their security posture, and either have made changes already or they're planning to do so. So, you know, now, like I said, it might mean different things for different organizations. Some might need better threat intelligence. Some might need to invest more in network security or move to a cloud or manage security. So it, when it comes to the actual um, security investment, they, they would be different for different organizations and different sectors. But the general trend that we are seeing that like it, it's almost kind of shaken the uh, businesses and made them realize how important it is for them to assess what they have and where are the gaps. Um, and, and, and and this is kind of all uh, going in the right direction, I would say. In terms of the um, sector specific view, again, it's across the board with uh, retail leading the changes to enhance the cybersecurity. Uh, but, uh, you know, energy and utility in this case is not too far behind in terms of their planning. So what does it mean for your, organi your organization in the story, Thomas? Yes, thanks, Nina. Let's uh, let's have a look. Um, this is John. He is the, the boss who allowed the hybrid working right after COVID. He, um, he keeps himself up to date, of course, with current current affairs. And the war is in the news all the time. But uh, we have to admit that under the service, it has actually been going on for a much longer time already. So in the past, John has regularly read stories in the paper about ransomware incidents and both municipalities and businesses who have needed to shut down because they can't access their data and their infrastructure anymore. So he keeps hoping it will not happen to him. But of course, it has been discussed and he asks Anna, Anna, what can we do? So Anna explains both investments in infrastructure and specialized services to add protection are needed, as well as awareness training, surveillance tools, not to mention backup systems and recovery procedures. You know, it becomes overwhelming. And John, of course, he grants some resources, uh, but uh, the sad truth is that John really needs to become a casualty before taking the threat really seriously. Just like that speed limit that should have been enforced or the red light, traffic light that should have been placed at the, at the crossroad section, you know, around the corner where you live. With ransomware, everyone is a target and ransom is adjusted to your size and capabilities. So this has been going on for many years and recent studies uh, from uh, compromised chat logs by famous ransomware groups have really revealed the size and scale of these organizations and have also revealed some hints of where they originate from and who they're connected to. You should really say organizations because it can be hundreds, several hundred people employed by these ransomware groups. Uh, and the chat logs have recently uh, clearly shown ties to Russian military and secret services. So this shows that you know the Russians have actually been attacking the West for a long time, uh, using it for financial gain and general disruption, uh, and of course to get financial gain in order to finance their war. And when we're now looking forward with all the financial section, sanctions in place, um, this type of money is really uh, needed by the enemy in order to continue financing what they what they need to do. So it's likely only going to increase. So it's a very tough battle to fight uh, because even though Anna convinces John to invest and John is happy, they made the decision, we are going to take this money, we're going to do more investment, we are going to be more protected, we'll be better than everybody else. John is happy. There is a big, big discrepancy between John and Anna's view of being ready. And this is very funny. When you dive into the survey results that we um, that we showed, and you segment them per persona, uh, then you'll see that okay, overall 39% have done thorough investigations and increased security posture since the war started. Good, they have taken the threat seriously. But if you break it down, then it's actually the 50% of the Johns think that they have done thorough investigation and invested. 
uh, and 15% of the AMAs, the technical leaders, say that they have invested. So there's a clear discrepancy there that the Johns don't uh, really understand how much time it takes for the AMAs to implement the new protection strategies. Uh, and they typically underestimate how well protected they are. So this becomes a general problem. Nina, does ransomware, what does the ransomware trend look like moving forward? And, and do we need to take it even more seriously in, in the future? What would you say? Yes, um, absolutely. And we found some uh, shocking uh, stats on ransomware, Thomas, um, on the next slide. Um, so from the image on your left, I mean, you can see the exponential damage that ransomware are causing to the global economy. I mean, look at it starting from $325 million in 2015 to $20 billion in 2021 and $42 billion by 2024. 265 billion by 2031 that's like a staggering number i mean again all the forecasts we can take with a pinch of salt but still these numbers are too big to ignore and also it says that it is it is real and it is going to stay like that so ransomware is going to be one of the um big challenges or um uh, you know the threats that every organization will have to have some protection against um in its across various sectors uh, we included the latest um anisa report here again this is quite specific to european organizations and you see like it's not just one industry versus another it, it goes um across the different sectors so it, these are some very um stats actually about the, and and you know some something that we have to definitely make part of our overall cybersecurity um, protection detection the the overall strategy. Okay, so uh, how do we then bridge the gap? We talked about the trends, and then of course we all now agree that threats are rising, but investments are increasing too, and the focus is shifting. So how how do we prioritize? So one way of taking advantage of cloud um, uh, of newer innovations or new technology is via cloud delivery cybersecurity, right? So this allows organizations to lay their hands on um, uh, latest um, solutions out there without having to invest in uh, capital um, expenditure, but treating more as operational expense uh, especially uh, beneficial for the small and medium businesses out there we did um, include that as a question in our survey because we wanted to understand the um, adoption of cloud um, services and we asked our um, decision makers how interested are they in that so of course there is um, again this is not a surprise right there is a growing interest in in cloud with more than half of uh, decision makers saying that they are already opting for cloud services in some form or another however it's actually quite insightful to see that you know 33 percent of respondents said that their requirements um are for on-premise security so yes when cloud we're talking about now and later but we can't you know ignore the fact that there is a lot of compromised technology that exists today and will continue to coexist as we uh, move forward so there, there is this um, uh, from cyber security vendor perspective i think it's important for us to realize that being able to support our customers in their whole kind of journey in their hybrid um, uh, uh, security stack. Uh, if we uh, again look into the sector specific view, then um, energy and utility is actually adopting cloud security much faster than anybody else. Um, that could also be driven due to the fact that they, they are making bigger investments now and moving more towards cloud applications, which then leads more towards uh, cloud cloud security as well. While SMBs are leaning more towards on-premise security because of having simpler systems like UPMs, not having you know stocks or um, uh, advanced detection and response uh, solutions. Um, so yeah, we kind of see see a mix in here. So I'll uh, 
give back to Thomas now. So how does it look for Anna? What it means for her? Well, uh, Anna, she needs to speed up implementation. And uh, in order to, to try to achieve that, she calls Peter. Peter is an administrator at the International MSSP with NC Christ really for help. So, so Peter, he understands the urgency of the matter and, and, and promises Anna to come back with a solution very quickly. So Peter says, do not worry, I have a good solution. We can utilize our security in the cloud. Peter promises that his platform will provide business continuity and it will scale uh, elastically towards the need and it will only have variable cost structures. Uh, so all while keeping secure protection of traffic and data. Sounds very attractive. However, there is an issue of trust. Anna is responsible for highly sensitive private data and applications that cannot be compromised. C is responsible for securing business continuity, even in terms of in times of crisis, whenever maybe connections towards data centers are compromised. Um, you know, this has been a topic where it has made a lot of noise lately. It has made impossible for us to use great free services like Google Analytics, just due to the nature of how Google utilizes personal data and monetizes this invading EU privacy laws. Uh, more close to Anna's concerns, Stockholm City and other public organizations have actively said they need to turn away from public cloud infrastructure and services, even Office 365. It cannot uh, use cloud-based services where data is stored or processed in American cloud infrastructure due to the cloud app act legislation and all the uncertainty around that. More recently in France, they initiated a ban of 365 and G Suite for all schools in the whole education sector. It is very attractive to get these services for free for the pupils, of course, but the French uh, authorities have decided that it's basically it's unethical to provide the usage behavior of the students to foreign companies in, in exchange for these type of services. So no more of that. And this is a general trend moving over all of Europe. So uh, John is, is slightly panicking. You know, who, who can he trust? What services can he safely use? What products are okay? And what security infrastructure can be trusted? It leads to the topic of the origin of cybersecurity. Is it important? Does John have a choice. Should he care about it? He turns to Anna for advice, of course, and Anna explains that historically, practically all cybersecurity protection solutions have come from Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley, Israel, or China, or of course from Russia. And the majority of these products and solutions on the market today come from some of these countries. And while it's obvious that you might not want to source from Russia anymore, it actually is only the German and the US government that have actively dared to advance the advice against using Russian software. Uh, so I, even though I have a hard time believing that companies or authorities would actively choose a Russian solution today, um, and it's quite remarkable that that it hasn't been made more clear that uh, that it shouldn't be used. Confidentially, co confidence is of course very very key in cybersecurity. Um, even before the invasion of Ukraine, very influential guidelines were published by some nations in the EU, including here in Sweden, on, for instance, the use of Chinese products in 5G in infrastructure it simply became forbidden. Many operators have incurred large costs as a consequence, including big names like Vodafone. And even if suppliers have fought back, the ban has remained. The issue here really is that Chinese laws state that citizens and companies must aid the intelligence agencies with information. Even if Huawei doesn't want to do any harm today, they cannot refuse to spy in the future uh, when they're being called upon. 
Um, so this is a this is a major issue. I, I read that uh, in the UK they are now removing all security cams cameras uh, that are made from Chinese um, Chinese make as well. So this is a, a trend that continues to 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 spiral forward. And if you think it's exaggerated, if you feel that this is excessive, you should perhaps know what they're doing on the other side. In China, the authorities have already decided that all PCs used in the public sector in China must be locally produced. They cannot, we're not talking about radio or security equipment. This is just ordinary standard PCs. And the Chinese themselves, you know, they basically, they don't trust anyone, only themselves. But the world is even more complex than this. Even though if you want to trust some other countries, you have to consider the political consequences when others do not. So here is a Swedish analyst firm Radar who points out in their assessment of the new geopolitical IP uh, world order that due to the war in Ukraine, uh, they analyzed that some Western companies have not uh, quickly enough publicly pulled out of Russia and made a statement against Russia. And with that lack of action, they have become a possible target for midfielders like Anonymous. So Israeli's checkpoint is one of those examples. Even if you trust them, they build great technology. Anonymous will likely not trust them and make them a target of hacktivism, resulting in increased risk exposure towards you. So it, this is really a tricky game. You have to be careful what and who you use. What Europe really needs is digital sovereignty. And it starts with choosing to be in control of the most critical parts of your network and infrastructure. So we asked our respondents, Nina, what does our survey say about this? Yeah, so uh, we asked our respondents about how important um, is origin of cybersecurity for them. And I think this is probably the first time that businesses will, were asked this question directly. But it, it's not an easy question to answer. Um, like how Thomas said, after all, the whole IT industry is built on borderless collaboration, right? But the times that we are in now and how geopolitical dynamics are changing uh, when we talk about uh, European sovereignty or data sovereignty, like th this is again one of those long term shifts that we will see. Uh, but um, we were actually even surprised to find that 57%, so more than half of the security decision makers said that either it's important to them or very important to them. Even knowing that, you know, we don't have the kind of cybersecurity um, ecosystem that we see in US or in Israel or um, UK even, um, as Tom said, these, these are kind of surprisingly high numbers. Um, it's something that is brewing and something that we will see more and more becoming prominent in the coming times, I would say. Uh, looking at the sector specific view uh, again, they are kind of consistent across sectors. It's not like, you know, um, one sector which we would expect, for example, energy and utilities or public sector coming up very high on that than the rest of um, the others. But uh, there isn't that much of deviation except SMB, of course, and, and that might also be around the awareness or um you know uh, thinking that they're too small to actually consider this but if they're part of critical infrastructure supply chain then it is as relevant to them as um, any big big vendor de de definitely a, a trend in making that we see um and again like i said before it's not an easy question to answer because what is going to drive that, right? Is it legislation? Is it, um, a, you know, d different guidance and recommendations? But do we have the uh, necessary infrastructure in place today to European infrastructure to tap into? And I, you, you, uh, you will see that, you know, from EU perspective, there are um, uh, kind of initiatives from all different directions 
there is a recent report that came out from European um, e e Bank um, uh, and uh, uh, EU Commission and talking more about how we need to boost the domestic cybersecurity investments because the level of uh, funding that we see in, um, let's say, US is nowhere comparable to what we have today in EU. So that really does need to be ramped up. Then there are um, uh, you know new regulations and legislations around Cyber Resilience Act, uh, for example, or NIS um, two directive. So so there, there there is a lot of things. I think we all kind of agree that it's important, and we all are looking at okay, what can we do, and which direction are we going to go? But it will take a lot more effort, both from industry side and from um, you know policymakers side, but from making investments possible and available. Uh, it, it is going to be a much more collective effort, and this is this is just the start of it. This is something we will see uh, becoming more relevant in the time, in the coming times. Okay, so with that, uh, we move on to our last topic for today. That's uh, defense in depth or layered security. I guess we we are now kind of we have established the fact that cybersecurity is changing in Europe, and companies need to take a more active look at what they've got and what they need. So the focus, first of all, needs to shift from tactical security to strategic security. So looking at it strategically, looking at it as an investment to minimize risk, business risk here we are talking about, it's not necessarily only related to IT, but need to be elevated at business risk level. And that's where a defense in depth strategy can be an ultimate um, for the business or part of their infrastructure. We asked this question, to our, um, our respondents, um, have you considered using a second or multiple layers of cybersecurity to improve your security coverage, like dual firewall? Again, it could mean different things for different organizations, right? So some organization uh, will employ multiple layers of cybersecurity, while others might bring redundancy by using, you know, um, two firewalls or dual firewalls by different vendors, for example. So again, it, it in terms of the actual implementation of it, it could be different for different organizations, but the goal is to have layered security, making it as difficult for um, attackers to penetrate as possible. And then, um, you know, making sure there is enough redundancy built in the um, uh, system that when something bad happens, it doesn't shut down everything completely, right? So, so it's all about, that um, uh, keeping it going and, and remediation um, er, um, efforts also. Uh, so again, uh, the stats show that 59% uh, uh, respondents said they are actively considering this, while 27% have said they're already doing this. So again, these are all one thing I think we could say from these market surveys. We uh, have seen some really positive trends and validation that things are going in the right direction. And uh, when we look at the sector specific view, then retail is showing a higher level of maturity for layered security approach. And I think it's it generally is aligned with the cyber security maturity level of different industries as well. Retail has been investing in their um, security solutions um, for a while now uh, because it had been one of the most vulnerable um, sectors and it, it now shows in terms of their um, maturity levels as well. Uh, it's extremely important for energy and utilities because of the whole IT and OT conversions and their requirements are on a completely um, different scale. But again, really good that 32% of them said they're already doing it and 58% um, um, responded that they are actively considering it. So all in all, very positive. So I'll give it back to Thomas again. So what does it look like in practice? Yeah, thank you, Nina. Um, so take uh, two of the critical services sites that Anna is managing. In the data center A, she places two firewalls in line, uh, at least one of them European. Uh, and in data center B, she does the same, but in the reverse order. 
then intrusion attempts will always happen. Likely most will be stopped by the first firewall, but if anything slips through, the second firewall can take the sec a second attempt to stop the hackers. Um, in the other data center, it will the same will happen, but in this example, the first firewall, a firewall identified all the dangerous traffic, so the second firewall doesn't show anything blocking in, in their logs. But as this is a cat and mouse game, platforms are never alike, and it's of course a good mitigation strategy to have several firewalls in line like this. You will significantly reduce business risk. Uh, there might be an extra cost involved, but this is the trade-off that Anna needs to make. Uh, is my data critical enough? Can I, do I need to secure um, a continuity in case of uh, geopolitical restrictions or whatsoever that will uh, compromise the continuity of the first firewall vendor? Um, you know, so make sure that if that happens, they could be taken out of line and you have one line of defense that you're being until you get a second player uh, in, in place again that you that you that you can trust. So the data centers will not stay unprotected or 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 compromised. And that as it turns out, you know, the public sector is actually already doing this with 19%, which is um, great uh, to see. And another, what was it, almost 60% is actively looking at doing this. And it makes all sense because of course completing this type of uh, setup really gives a complete peace of mind to both John and Anna, uh, both uh, short term to know that you know if, if they're not up to date with patch levels all the way, uh, the, the risk will be shared and mitigated. But also long term, if one of the vendors is compromised or one of the um, one of the uh, countries has 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 turned its tides and on how it can deliver towards uh, Europe. Um, the second European vendor would, would cover this. So, uh, Nina, let's go to the questions. If you have any questions, type them into the chat. I see there's some coming in already. Nina, do you want to pick up the first question? Yes, I, I do, and thank you, Thomas, for that. Uh, I just wanted to also quickly mention that we do have the market, the full uh, market survey report at the link here and there is a QR code also if you want to um, download it uh, quickly so it has all of the details that we talked about today and more. So the first question Thomas and, and it is going to be a tricky question uh, for you. We talked about the origin of cyber security and European sovereignty and all that. So where does the hardware uh, come from? So is that not from China as well? So is that not an issue? Yes, uh, this is the problem. Um, uh, absolutely. Uh, basically, in, during the era of globalization, the majority of all hardware production has moved away from Europe. Um, and some efforts are ongoing now to bring that back. I know that there is large investment in chip manufacturers and, and other type of manufacturing facilities in, in Europe. But the situation today is the majority of our hardware is coming from, from China. Uh, we do have some uh, production in Europe today, specifically when we um, deliver uh, solutions towards the military and defense solutions, then the hardware comes from Europe. So there it is um, uh, already today, a must. Uh, but I think we will see a shift in this for, 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 for the general public, especially public sector in the future uh, as well. Uh, but it's going to take some time. The European Union needs to build uh, build up its capability to be um, uh, uh, self-sufficient again. Um, uh, and a good alternative to shortcut this is to run uh, virtualization. Uh, you can then uh, pick the hardware of your choice or even build your own hardware from components. Uh, and run uh, the Clevister firewalls in a virtualized fashion. Um, another good way is to use European cloud offerings. So you have the large three or four, Microsoft and those, but you know they are American companies and they conform to American laws. But there are also alternatives in Europe. And Clevister works together with, for instance, 
OVH, a French cloud provider, or Jura, a Swedish cloud provider, or IONOS, a, a German cloud provider. And you can run uh, Clevster Netvol uh, in a public cloud environment, but in guaranteed in Europe, owned by European players. So there are alternatives out there. So let's pick another question. Um, third party risks are putting put more and more onto the agenda, specifically pointed out by the EU, for instance, in the banking sector, but also as part of the NIS2 directive, right? Um, it's applicable to many sectors. So Nina, do you see that municipalities and other organizations are taking a holistic approach in order to cover this? Um, absolutely, yes. And if they're not doing it today, that's what uh, these um, regulations or legislations are kind of advising companies and organizations to um, do do so. So, you know, and this two directive is a very uh, recent one, right? So it will take uh, some time for everybody to unwrap and to understand the implications of it and uh, what the actual necessary action that needs to be taken. Uh, but we all, as we've been discussing, we all understand third party risks, right? And being part of the uh, uh, supply chain or having access to confidential sensitive data. All of this means that cybersecurity is as much as a threat uh, for us as any other business out there. Um, so I think the overall um, theme and, and something that we also wanted to bring out through this webinar, this presentation is that move from you know tactical investment to looking at it looking at cyber security more strategically so having a well documented security plan calculate your business risk understand your you know threat context because again it's different for different organizations depending on the, the nature of their work and um, the um, data that they hold so all of it is really uh, you know Start, take a step back, evaluate, make a plan, and uh, uh, you know, uh, go uh, towards when things go wrong because it's not a question of if but when. So, what will happen? How will they tackle this? And you know, how will um, organizations respond to ransomware, for example, right? Or any other kind of attack. So, what's the strategy there? What, what, what's the plan? So, have a ready made mitigation plan and that that's going to be so so much more uh, important and companies that do that or organizations that do that properly will be able to generate that trust between their customer and themselves right so it is almost it could be used as an advantage um cyber security done properly is a, an, a competitive um, advantage for companies Okay, so uh, with that, I'm just looking at the questions here. We have uh, one more, so I'll ask you this, Thomas. So, what in your experience, what is the biggest threat? Uh, what what is the first order of business that organizations um, need to cover? So, what should be oh, yeah, the you know you. kind of key takeaway from here? Yeah, thank you, Nina. Absolutely. First order of business is implement multi-factor authentication on all the services, right? Preferably go total passwordless. Use an app on your phone in order to secure the login. Um, and we asked this question to our to our audience, and many have started this journey but are not completing it, right? They have to make sure that you eliminate the login from all the applications and services that your employees are using. Um, so uh, use technologies like single sign-on and other type of portals in order to make this easy, both for you know IT administrators and 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 users out there. So that's that's the absolute biggest tip, I think. So I, I see no other questions. Um, I think. Um, uh, um, I, I do have one more question, Thomas. Yeah. Uh, when will you release MFA for VPN? I think it's uh, it is running in beta today. If you want to uh, start using it, contact uh, Matthias, product manager, or or me, and we'll get you in queue. Uh, a general release is uh, is planned as soon as possible. 
Okay, I think with that we have come to the end of our session. I hope everybody found it useful and there were something from here that was relevant for um, everyone. And if you have uh, more questions, uh, please do keep them coming. You can send a, um, um, an email to marketing at gavistage.com or contact us um, um, separately. Absolutely happy to answer any questions. Thank you and a very good rest of your day. Thank you very much.